everyone to the Ecological Society workshop on abstracts. I'm really glad to have you all here. I wanted to introduce myself a little bit. I'm Bruce Kirchhoff. I'm a emeritus faculty member at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Last few years, I have been working in scientific communication. I have a book out on scientific communication. Let me say a couple of introductory words before we get going. Scientific communication is a skill. It's a skill that needs practice. You can intellectually understand all, the, all that you would like about scientific communication and still not be able to write a good abstract, still not be able to write a good title, still not be able to communicate well. You're only gonna get this skill if you practice it. So it's like a sport. You don't get good at basketball. You don't get good at soccer. You don't get good at any sport unless you get out there and you practice the sport. And that may mean that at the beginning, you don't do very well at it, but gradually you build up skills and you get much, much better at it. That building up of skills really never stops. So what's the structure of a good abstract? That's what we're gonna talk about today. It's very simple, simple to understand. We start out with what we already know. First part of the abstract tells the background of the work that you're doing. Not a big surprise there. Then there's a problem should state as clearly as possible what the problem or hypothesis that you're directing is. And that goes right after you state what the background knowledge is. The major part of the abstract is taken up by methods and results. But by major, I do not necessarily mean really long. People write really long methods and results, which is really in my mind unnecessary for abstracts, especially for abstracts for scientific talks. People don't need to know all of your methods and results in order to know whether they want to come to your talk. What they need to know is what problem you're addressing and what you're going to say about it. And then they're going to come and hear the details. And then you can tell them details about methods and results when they're there. But you want to get them into the room first. Oh, writing overly long abstracts, in my mind, just distracts from you. You're free to disagree with me. But I believe that this is going to this works very well, and I'm going to show you some great abstracts from nature that follow this pattern. They're very short and very informative. And then you end up with conclusions, and by conclusions, I mean the broader impacts of your work. What's your work mean for science? What's it mean if you took that problem you, you addressed at the beginning and you solved it? What would that mean for people? That's the best kind of conclusion we would like to see in an abstract. Now, that's not always possible. It's not always possible for young scientists, especially graduate students, to have big conclusions on here. But you should keep that in mind that you're going toward that and then catch, and then if you're gonna put your major result at the end, the results and conclusions can be different. But if you put your major result at the end, try to make it as broad as possible. Think about where this, what your research, what the significance of your research is. So there's a, those are the four parts. Not a big surprise, you'll say. I always knew all that, state of the art, problem, methods and results, conclusions. You will be surprised at how few students do this. Almost no student abstracts follow this pattern. Even some of the abstracts you find in nature and science don't follow this pattern. So everyone knows it or thinks they know it, but they don't know how to do it. And so that's what I mean about practice. We need to practice this. It's so hard because I'm asking you by following this pattern to reconceptualize your research, to think about it in a different way. If you attended the titles workshop a couple of weeks ago, you got an introduction to that. When you're thinking about a title, I ask you to write a title that gives your major conclusion of your work, something like what you would put at that conclusion statement there. In fact, when we write titles, oftentimes we can oftentimes read of a good abstract, we can read the last sentence, and write a title based on that, because the conclusion and the title should be those that <clears throat> very concise statement. So that really means you have to understand your research very deeply, understand it and its significance to science in a very deep way. So that's what I'm asking you to do for this very simple, simple outline for how to write an abstract. I'd like to have your opinion about what types of abstracts are, well, what part of the abstract is most commonly missing from student abstracts? So I've got a little quick survey here, one question. So let's see what people think. So 
the highest one is the conclusions, and the second highest are the current state of the knowledge, the problem being addressed, and the methods and the results there. So let's start with methods and results. So certainly I, that I agree that that is the least, the thing that is least missing from student abstracts. And that's really easy to understand. Students have spent a lot of time on methods and results. That's what they know in depth. And of course, they want to write all about that. And that's why I say when we think about titles and conclusions, we really have to reconceptualize our work. We have to step back from all that little detail about how you run the machines, about you know, how you do the analyses, about all the statistics and things that are in there. And we have to focus on what the meaning of the work is. Where does it fit into a larger picture of science? So here we're completely on the same page that methods and results should be at the bottom of that. I wasn't sure how this was gonna come out with conclusions versus current state of knowledge. In my experience, I, I see current state of knowledge tends to be a little bit better represented. Again, because I think that students have, have to write that. Their committee forces them to write something about where the, the background of their research, something about the background of their research. <clears throat> and so uh, the current state of knowledge, I think, is a little better than the conclusions that come in there. The problem being addressed is the one that I find most often missing. It's sometimes implied, but it is very seldom clearly stated. Sometimes I can't even tell what they were. I can tell what they did, but I can't tell what the problem is that they're doing, except no one else has ever done this, which is really not a very good statement of the problem that you're working on. So that's very interesting to me to see what your results are on that. Let's go on and look at some abstracts and some examples. So I've got two examples. You don't need to read this. I'm just going to show you the parts of it and summarize what they are. So there's an abstract from one of the nature journals. So look at the beginning of it. The first sentence, very succinct statement of what we know. Reduce regional sea ice is coincident with cold, mid-latitude winters, etc. Okay. But, so here's the big problem. And problems often start with but, or in scientific terms, we say but with however, because we're not supposed to start sentences with but, but it is a but. It remains unclear whether the observed links are casual, causal, whether the observed links are causal. So that's a problem. How are we going to address it? Let's skip all this middle stuff and go down here. Our results show robust support for anomalous atmospheric circulation simultaneously driving cold middle latitude winters and middle latitude conditions, etc. Okay, so a clear statement of what their results show. And this is a little more toward the results side than the big picture there, but it implies, right, that there is a, a meaning to this research that goes beyond the specific findings that they had. It implies that this would be useful in modeling, etc. Notice that the middle does not have any statistics in it. It does not have any abbreviations in it. It does not have a huge description of how they made their models. That stuff's in the paper, it's not in the abstract. It is a brief description of what they did and what they found. This is a great abstract, a great abstract for a talk also. Someone outside of your field can read this abstract and quickly understand what you're doing without getting bound, bogged down in all the observations that you made in all the methods that you used. There's a place for those. I don't believe it's in the abstract. We'll look at an abstract where people give so much data in that middle part that the abstract is almost unintelligible. Even for people who work in that field, there are so many abbreviations, so much technical data, you just can't understand what the takeaway message is. What did they want me to learn from that? So here's the thing. You are not speaking to your committee when you come to the Ecological Society of America. You do not have to prove yourself that you know your stuff. You are up there in front of an audience and they are gonna assume that you're an expert unless you show them that you're not. You do not have to prove that you know how to do these techniques. You have to prove that to your committee, but that is not the Ecological Society of America. That is not their role. Their role is to come there and learn about what you've done and hopefully to learn something new about ecology from you. So that's what you wanna tell them, what you did, what's new about it, and 
you can go into detail about your methods and your, and your results in the talk, but not in the abstract. It doesn't need the abstract. Abstract is there to get them in the door. So those are the four parts done masterfully in this research from Nature Climate Change. Here's another one, another nature journal, Nature Plants. Again, we've got the background is relatively short, reduced insect populations found on long-term organic farms have mostly been attributed to increased biodiversity, et cetera. The background information that we need to understand what their problem is that they're addressing. The problem, the role of plant resistance has largely been ignored. So there's a problem with the previous research. Let's try to fill that gap. They talk in the middle about how they did that and briefly their results. And then they summarize it at the bottom here, organically managed soils and microbial communities may play an unappreciated role in reducing plant attractiveness to pests by increasing plant resistance. And look what they did with that information at the top. They turned that into their title, organic management promotes national pest control through altered plant resistance to insects. Beautifully clear, simple to understand. Even if you know nothing about organic management, you don't care about organic farms, you read this abstract and you say, I might like to know something about this. It is so clear. That's what you're trying to find. That's, so that's what you're going for. A very clear statement of what your research shows and the significance of that research. Don't worry about the length. Scientific societies often give you a lot of space to write your abstracts. You do not have to fill up that abstract. I know that I felt it every time, so you're probably feeling it too, that you have to have an abstract that fills those number of words. That is not true. There is no abstract police. No one is gonna count the number of words in your abstract. No one is gonna to come to your talk because there are more words in it. They're gonna to come to your talk if they understand your abstract. And that can mean fewer words. Einstein famously is reported to have said, if you can't explain it simply, you do not understand it well enough. I have found that to be very true in my own work. And I wish that I had started working on it when I was young, started explaining my research simply. I understand it much better. Other people understand it much better. I encourage you to do the same thing. Think about your research in simple terms. Simple meaning, don't go on too long. About it. Okay, what we have got now is a set of journal articles. So what I'm gonna ask you to do then is choose an abstract. I'll just open the first one here. And you see the instructions are in each of the abstracts. You're to go in and you're to highlight the parts of the abstract that show the different parts of that we've just been talking about. So same color scheme I just used, yellow for introduction, pink for the problem, gray for the conclusions, and the stuff in the middle will be the methods and the results. We're back. And we'd like a volunteer to look at, let's look at some of the abstracts. Both Maria and I work on the same one together, number four. So for whatever that's worth. Bad evolution. Maria, do you want to go ahead first? Yeah, really, we've read it truly. And we thought that um, there was, a, we highlighted the most, the three important parts. But however, we thought that they, it was quite incomplete, a lot of senses. Uh, just for the word count, and it was not clear uh, what is the background and how they clearly separate both the background and their question. It's not it's not clear for us. So they they really synthesize everything in one sentence, and we thought it was too broad because it's not clear what has been done previously in terms of uh, pollination and plant herbivory and how this drive plant diversity. And um, yeah, that's kind of it, more or yeah. less. And how about the um, overall conclusions? Were they results or were they broader conclusions in the very end? I felt like it was, I tried to pick one, I said it's more results. They mm -hmm. did try to talk about conclusions, like you know, this importance of this crosstalk between both types of interactions. But I almost feel like it was a last minute slap it on instead of a mm -hmm. forefront, forethought from the beginning of writing that sentence. Yeah, so you can see how difficult this is. I mean, <clears throat> this is really great research and published in a very important journal. And it's still very difficult to think through your research in a way that clearly presents it to a reader who is outside your field. So I think you've done a good job in identifying what 
they were, what the background is here and what the problem is. The, the problem is kind of implied that it need, they need to be studied together. These two factors need to be studied together. They don't say why. They don't say why the importance of that is. So there's a little bit of that, well, no one's ever done it before aspect, which is a very weak reason for doing research. I'm sure that there are reasons here why they should be studied. They shouldn't be studied in isolation, but they just don't say it. And the same thing with the overall conclusions here. Um, and they are more a little more results oriented than looking at the broader picture of what this means. And you can kind of see that there's a relationship there between a failure to have a really clearly stated problem and a failure to have really to look at how that problem affects science and more generally what it affects broader outside of your results. So that, pro that problem or that inclusion of an important problem is very important. And I think it's the thing that is all, very often missing is a clear statement of a, the problem that you're being addressed. When it is there, the abstracts get very easy to understand. And I think we'll see some others where it's more clear than this one. Great, well, thanks so much for volunteering. Great analysis. Do we have someone else who would like to do, do one? Who did Insects in Deadwood, number 22? Yeah, I can talk through it. Great, thank you. Um, yeah. So the first two sentences seemed like some introduction, background information. And then the problem I identified was um, a lack of understanding about the contribution of insects, the decomposition of deadwood and carbon release. Um, and then they had a very technical methods and results section that probably went a little bit too into depth. And then the conclusion was that there was a functional importance of insects in the decomposition of deadwood in the carbon cycle, which does relate to the problem they identified, but um, it seemed pretty nonspecific to me. Um, I'm not really sure why this matters, why exactly they were doing their research. Yeah, so it could have been a little bit clearer. It's still better. It's still a little better than the last one I think we looked at in that they identify their problem a little more clearly. And that lets them in their significant sec section at the very end, it lets them be more specific about what the significance or the conclusions of the research are. But if they could be even more specific about why the contribution of insects to deadwood composition is important, then we would have even a better understanding at the end. So this may be in the paper, you know, in the introduction to the paper explaining that this is a contribution to modeling. So knowing the, <clears throat> the percentage of um, decomposition that is due to insects may affect how we model um, carbon release and other kinds of things. So again, we see how having that clear problem statement there really helps you understand the research, helps you communicate to your audience very clearly about what the significance of your research is gonna be. One comment or question I might make is um, looking at this, it seems like the problem they say is um, this isn't well understood. We, we don't know much about this relationship in ecology. And looking at my own work, like that's sometimes the problem statement I have is, you know, not much is known on this relationship. Do you think that's a, you just said, but that wasn't a good or an ideal problem statement. Yeah, At let's some say, point today, are you talking or we'll be talking about what you think is a good problem statement? Well, be more specific, a better problem statement. And again, it's on a it's on a scale, right? It's not certainly the worst problem statement, which would be no problem statement. And it's not no one's done any work on this before, which is kind of like the second tier of not good. It's up there a little higher than that. And even better than that might be, you know, um, why is it important to know this? We don't know very much about it. And if we knew this, it would. And then that if would becomes your conclusions at the bottom. Now we know it and now we know this. So you know, tell your audience, not just that we don't know enough about this, but why it makes a difference that we don't know enough about that. What's this gonna inform? Is it gonna make, allow us to make better models? Is it gonna allow us to do better ecological management? Is it going to increase? Is it gonna test some theory? <clears throat> There's this theory out there and we, this data says this kind of thing, but no one has looked at this specific aspect of the implication of the theory. And now if we could run this kind of test, then we would know, et cetera, you know, so. I did number 16. Water cycling, you can walk us through it. So this one was super clear. It was for the introduction. 
first sentence, problem, second sentence, conclusion, last sentence. And then the uh, methods and results were very non-technical. There's only one number. There's a percentage given over 50%. So uh, as numbers go about the least technical that that could be. And like no uh, abbreviations, minimal jargon, that kind of thing. I think also the problem statement, so it's definitely like the second sentence, but then like kind of bleeds into the third sentence a little bit, like the first half of the third sentence, I wasn't sure if a like lower bound estimate of the contribution of uh, bedrock water storage to transpiration across the continental US would count as, as part of the problem statement. <clears throat> yeah, really, it doesn't really matter how we analyze these things. And the more important thing is we get we get these con concepts right and we have practice applying the concepts. Exactly where we draw the lines isn't that important. I might draw them slightly differently. And things like I've done all of these. Let me see what I did on 16. Just I did it like you did. You know, my analysis was looked just like yours. Another person might include it a little bit more in the next sentence. Not so important. I think more important here is some of the other points you made. So if we look at the problem, like soil moisture, bedrock water storage serves as an important source of plant water. If it did, if it did, then conceptual paradigms regarding water and carbon cycling may need to be revised, right? So this is Austin's question from last time. And here's a perfect example of where someone has said, not only did we not know about this, but if we knew about it, here's what it would, here's the difference it would make. And then that can lie, that lays right into the conclusions at, at the end. Notice this is a nature article. It doesn't have a lot of data in the abstract. That data is certainly in other parts of the article. There's places to have that, all that stuff. But an important finding, if this is an important finding and, an, and nature wants to reach a broad audience, it, its intention of nature articles is to reach beyond your narrow specialty. All of that technical data in there is going to make that harder to understand. If you want to do something that is really beyond what I think is an, an introductory workshop on this, go look up what nature requires for their abstracts. They've got it broken down sentence by sentence. They say a sentence like this, and then a sentence that does this, and then a sentence does that. As I say, not everyone follows that, but you can get a very detailed guide. Uh, there were a couple of us that actually worked on that one. Oh, let's look at that. Good. We actually both have work in progress that had something to do with this. Uh, that was oh, good. good. <laughs> uh, but it seemed like the problem statement was very clear. Uh, the background was very clear. And the uh, conclusions were exceptionally clear, uh, broken into two sentences. There was um, kind of a bit of specific information and a little bit of broader information, as far as we could tell. The methods in the middle though were exceptionally technical we could probably do without all of the actual variable symbols and that would have cut down a lot on how technical it just looks at first glance reading through it though it basically it delves into a lot of the modeling components that go into this kind of study and that's probably a bit more information than the casual reader would want if the other person if the person reading through a um, conference program if that person was very much into soil water modeling and things like that they would dive right in and say yeah i need to see this talk but it might turn off a lot of other people that aren't that deep into it yeah i mean that generally is my reaction to it also so Way back in postdoc days, I said it in a workshop that were not a workshop, but a discussion group that ran over the course of some months about um, stem water potentials. And so we didn't do a soil water potentials, but we dealt with you know some technical aspects of transpiration. And it's a long time ago, but I couldn't understand anything of the details here after those <laughs> after those many years of not working on that. But still, there should have been some background that I could bring over. But I was all Greek to me. Yeah. So oh, literally. Yeah. <laughs> I yes, literally. <laughs> I think you have to ask yourself on <clears throat> when you're writing these abstracts what conference you're going to and who your audience is going to be. So this middle part of the abstract would be very appropriate as our speaker again. I don't know who was speaking there. Just said 
would be very appropriate if they were giving an, a talk at a conference on soil water potentials or that dealt in that general area where everyone at the conference is gonna know all the symbols and is gonna know the details of this, this kind of abstract might be very appropriate. At a general ecological society conference, it depends. And you have to think about this carefully. If you're in a symposium that deals only with water potentials, maybe. If you only wanted the people who are in that symposium who worked in that area to understand your abstract. If you are hoping to draw someone else in who didn't work in this area, this may not be the abstract you want. So if you're giving a contributed paper, you know, this may not be the abstract that you want and you're just bringing people in and do a contributed paper section. So we haven't talked about audience on here yet. I've just been assuming that we know that the audience is going to be a general ecological audience. And that's how we've been analyzing these abstracts. But we see in this abstract that there are cases where you might want to have more detail in your methods and, and so on. You just have to take that audience in, into account and see what your audience expectations are gonna be. The results, are the, the conclusions, are those conclusions or results? It seems to me like that's how you would boil down your more technical results into a conclusions paragraph in your paper. It doesn't quite go as far in terms of significance as you might want. Now, that's what I say. It's an excellent summary of the results. Yeah. I mean, really excellent summary of the results. <clears throat> and sometimes that's all you can do. That's all that you're gonna be comfortable with doing. <clears throat> but we would like to eventually get to the stage where we can say what the significance is. This. Why does it matter? There is the second sentence in the background statement does mention adaptation to climate change. So the author might have just gone a step further in the conclusion there to relate it back to what's to be expected. Right, that really good point. And that second sentence as such, that begins with as such there, I would have, personally, I highlighted that as pink in this case as part of the problem statement. And so that, again, links that problem statement to those conclusions or significant statements in a very nice way, as you just pointed out. Great. Any other comments about this abstract? We did consider back and forth a little bit about that second sentence. I kind of felt that it was not a not part of the problem statement for this particular paper, but maybe what someone else said was the problem. And so providing that as background instead would motivate the problem for this particular study. And so that's just kind of where we drew the line between the yellow and the pink sections. I think that's a perfectly reasonable interpretation. Someone else want to go and do one of their ab abstracts? Um, I guess... I'll go. I, I worked on number 24. I was having a lot of difficulty <laughs> with this abstract. So I think initially upon first read, it seems like they're sort of identifying a problem and then talking about um, not knowing what the mechanism behind taproot decline. And so that I initially thought was the um, problem statement, but then they go on to describe this uh, disease in soybeans uh, for a couple more sentences, and then they introduce um, what secondary metabolites are. And then they talk about in the fifth sentence, I think, um, kind of what is known already. So preliminary experiments using soybean stem cuttings suggested blah, blah, blah. And then finally they say, but these SMs have not had not yet been identified. And so that to me seemed like the actual problem statement. <laughs> and in terms of the methods and results. I'm I'm also curious, curious to know, uh, this type of research is completely out of my wheelhouse, but um, they basically bounce between presenting, talking about a method and then a result, and then another method and another result, another method, another result. And I'm wondering kind of what your take on that is, if, if structuring, you know, a methods result section of an abstract is is works, you know, in this situation, or is it usually better to group all of your methods together and all of your results together? And then finally, the conclusion is just that very last statement, I believe. So the identification of SMs capable of causing just an important role for these SMs in the etiology of TRD. Now, I don't think it's the strongest conclusion. Do you know what TRD is? Uh, I had to remind myself. Okay, so you'd have to, I'd have to look it up too. Right. Um, yeah, there's a lot of acronyms. The The results are pretty, where I found pretty challenging to, to follow. And I don't know if Obeyemi has any other thoughts. Yeah, it's a very difficult abstract. And 
very hard to understand. It's very interesting that you brought up the point about um, methods, results, method, results, method, results. So there's like a layer cake there. Now that's a very interesting structure. I don't think it's a very good structure for an abstract, but there is a place to use that kind of structure. <clears throat> and that place can be a talk. So one way to structure a talk, and I go into quite a bit more detail about this in the book, especially in the context of longer talks, is to present your results in just that way. Talk about a general problem that you're working on, talk about the results of those from dealing with that problem. And then you, as you all know, the results of a problem never are completely satisfactory. There's always something remaining and that leads you to the next problem. And you can talk about the methods for addressing that and the results of that. And so you can walk through, especially for longer talks, through sections like that, bringing your audience along with you. So it's interesting that they use that procedure here of la this layer cake procedure, which works in some cases, but perhaps not in abstracts. Way too much detail for abstracts. They did and start out pretty well. Their, <clears throat> in their initial background statement is good, very short, but at least it gives you an idea of what they're working on. And then they're going to tell you that the mechanisms are not well known, but then they make that more explicit later on. So they could have perhaps been more specific about what they were going to work on at the very beginning by bringing things together. And there may be other problems that are in through the route that they could have bring up to the top and synthesize. So this is just a really nice example of someone who hasn't completely worked through their results. They are not yet able to write a succinct statement of what their research is about. Nothing wrong with the research. You can do great research and not be able to explain it. There are different kinds of skill sets. I just want you to appreciate that and that it does take this learning that we're working on now in order to be able to take really excellent results and then synthesize them in a way that someone outside of your field who hasn't sat with you while you did the while you did all this research will be able to understand and appreciate. This is a nice example of how not to do that. So here's a comment from the chat. I'm also having some difficulties in trying to understand what the conclusion of the work is about, and there are a lot of technicalities. It's so technical, the conclusions down here at the very bottom in gray are so technical that it's very, even there, it's very hard to understand them. The abbreviations don't help at all. Please try not to use abbreviations any place in your writing. Here is the visual summary of what we've done today. Just remind us that you all have got this very well understood at this point and have got some experience now applying it in a number of different situations and thinking through some different aspects. The first part, the current state of knowledge, the problem that you're addressing, methods and results, which can be relative, pretty much abbreviated for an abstract, and then the conclusions, or we could say the significance of the work. What's what we're really going there, or what's the bigger significance of this work? What's it mean to someone who didn't do the work, who might work outside of your field? And I just remember, I do have this book out there, which I can take a look at.